You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hanning here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. This week we discuss Catholic journalism and publishing. We're keen to explore as well the media landscape in a time of cultural confusion. Our welcome guest is Greg Erlinson. In 2016, he became editor-in-chief of Catholic News Services. CNS serves Catholic publications and dioceses throughout the United States and around the world. For 15 years, Erlinson was president and publisher of the Sunday Visitor Publishing Division. He had served first as editor-in-chief at OSV Publishing. In 2014, he was one of six experts appointed by the Council of Cardinals to the Vatican Media Committee to propose reforms for the Vatican's media operations. He is also co-author of Pope Benedict XVI and the Sexual Abuse Crisis, Working for Reform and Renewal. Let's begin, as always, in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. 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 Greg, can you give us, for a starter, uh, an overview of Catholic journalism today, perhaps noting some of its highs and lows? And along the way, can you highlight some of the changes that you've seen? Sure, Jim. Uh, And there's been a lot, and it parallels in many ways what's happening in secular media, um, where we see the, uh, on the one hand, the diminishment of traditional news sources, and then at the same time, sort of a a growth of alternative news sources of all of all sorts, uh, persuasions and quality. Um, And and I think that's uh, in in the Catholic world. Uh, we, we have to go back to the financial crisis of 2008, uh, which I think dealt a, a blow to uh, so many of the uh, dioceses and their financial situation. Uh, and then, of course, the, the pandemic and the impact that that's had uh, more recently. So um, you hate to talk just about money when you're in an area of mission, but the financial situation has really been um, quite significant. And uh, so what we're seeing is a decline of the diocesan press. Uh, There's generally kind of a a pattern to this, but they 
uh, it may go from weekly to biweekly, from biweekly to monthly, monthly to magazine. Um, they or they may just stop altogether, um, relying more on a diocesan website and social media uh, as alternatives. But however you look at it, I think the, the landscape is changing, um, and, and there's a lot of areas that we can talk about in that in terms of professionalization and all. Um, what I find revealing and, uh, and, and understandable is that the Catholic Press Association, uh, which has been around since uh, 1911, is changing its name to the Catholic Media Association. And over the last several years, including when I was president of it, has been trying to reach out beyond simply the traditional sort of print media that was always its mainstay, and now they're bringing in community diocesan and communication directors and um, uh, even even parish communication directors and and broadening their scope. Uh, and, and I think that's a sign of, of, of a lot of the changes that are coming. And, of course, there's a lot of, of uh, challenges there. For example, is, is someone who sets up a podcast or a blog, a journalist, um, you know, what criteria do you use? Uh, it used to be that, especially when you're dealing with primarily um, institutional uh, media organizations, that, that there was kind of a, at least a de facto uh, approvement, uh, approval by a bishop or some sort of church authority, um, and, and, it, and that changes a lot too. So there, there's a lot of this sort of fragmentation that's going on. There's there's, um, I think, more ideological um, polarization. It's, it's always uh, been there a bit. Uh, one could say, um, you know, it used to be uh, the, the wanderer on one side, then you had the National Catholic Register, then you had our Sunday visitor, and then you had National Catholic Reporter. And so, you you know, that sort of encapsulated the, the ideological spectrum of the church. But I think it's become much more diverse and and Unfortunately, in some cases, much less um, professional um, as well. So, and, and then a final, that's looking, again, primarily at the newspapers. You can expand out into magazines and all. But what, what you're seeing also is a, a shift in the, in the business model, which is moving away from a subscription model, which has always traditionally been, you know, between – subscriptions and then some sort of institutional support. Now now you're going towards donations and some kind of foundation support. So take the National Catholic Reporter, which probably has never turned a profit, um, but has always found different ways to support itself, you know, in terms of, of revenue, um, but has, has been building up uh, over the last several years their They've been building up more of an endowment to sustain themselves. Um, uh, of course, uh, the most famous right now probably would be EWTN, um, Catholic News Agency, which would be you know relying a great deal on on donations to to keep them funded. But but you're seeing that model happen in, in other places as well. So so the business model shifting, the audience is fragmenting. Um, the financial status is more more precarious for traditional media, and we're seeing lots of sort of new media springing up. That probably would be the the best overview, right? Uh, quick overview of what's going on. That's a pretty comprehensive and pretty instructive overview. I wonder if Mario, you might have some follow ups on that. Uh, yes, uh, I have a, a question. I think is more. Um, I don't know if I would say technical, but um, um, when we talk about Catholic journalism, what is really what we are trying to say? Are we trying to say that there is a clerical way? Catholic way of addressing issues, giving our background, or are we talking about journalists who happen to be Catholics 
And if that is so, then there may be some people who may not be working for EWTN or any other outlet of that sort, but still Catholic working in a secular newspaper or um, any other um, outlet. What really we mean when we say Catholic journalism? Well, it's it's a good question. It's a little difficult to answer because, it's, again, looking at the secular world, you, you know, what qualifies as journalism can be can be rather wide ranging. In fact, if we look at our newspaper, um, if people still look at newspapers, uh, they, you know, you have all different levels, right? You have the the front section, the news, you have the opinion, you have sports, you have social commentary and all these kinds of things that are going on. It, 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 Catholic journalism, I think there, there is a debate um, that is, are, are you uh, um, uh, a journalist who happens to be Catholic or are you a Catholic first and, and then a journalist um, in, it influences your journalism? Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm both interested in it because it's been my life uh, and and wary of it in some ways because there can be an ideological component that that can come in to that. But I think um, my feeling and how I, you know, see my role is that we're Catholic first who's a journalist. I think that where this becomes really um, interesting is, for example, in the whole notion of, you know, how, how one reports. So I think that a Catholic, uh, however you want to frame it, a Catholic brings um, additional knowledge and experience. And there are non-Catholics who are, who are journalists, um, in, you know, for, for a number of organizations, um, often who bring a great deal of knowledge to, to, the, to their work. Uh, but but primarily Catholic, um, primarily a way, you know, I found in my experience, I first started at the National Catholic Register when it was based in Los Angeles, um, and, and it certainly became a means of deepening my, my faith. Um, but uh, I, I think there's, a, there's a, a commitment that journalism has where you, you bring to sort of telling the truth, being transparent, um, uh, it's, you don't see yourself only in the sense of you, you, you distinguish between journalism and say propaganda to use an incredibly loaded negative term. But um, uh, so so you're reporting on on the issues, but you're always bringing this this experience. You're you're bringing in a deeper understanding of what the church may say or comment on in a in a particular issue. But if you look at the one of the most interesting essays, actually, I think it was in 2013, it was Father Matt Malone in America Magazine wrote kind of his his defense of how they view journalism. And he, in fact, says at one point, we were Catholics first and, and then journalists. On the other hand, I got in a debate uh, at a Catholic uh, media conference with John Allen over this whole notion, and he, he was sort of arguing, you know, journalists first who happens to be Catholic. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, you know, you're bringing your faith to the table. You're also, you're doing the vocation, which I think is a vocation of Catholic journalism, and you uh, are trying to adhere to the standards of your craft, and at the same time, you are a, a man or a woman of faith operating within that context. So if I can interject uh Sure. That is my my experience. I have been a columnist for forty years, and I began writing because I love writing. Because I know a little bit about journalism, um, not because I was Catholic, and so my honesty, transparency, fidelity to fact came from my professionalism, but. What happened was that in the meantime, yes, I become, became more and more aware of my faith. 
Now, that means that I can work, and I've been working in secular media. And so perhaps not saying up from that I'm a Catholic, rather showing the soundness of an argument or the fidelity to fact so the reader can see by himself or herself. Now, the other approach that I have been uh, witnessing is that what we call, at least we call in Latin America, clericalism. I think the Pope echoed that very well. In other words, say, well, you write for a Catholic outlet. You are supposed to be Catholic. Now, in the big scheme of things in a pluralistic democracy, some people say, hey, I'm not going to read your column because you are already claimed to be Catholic. However, these people may be more inclined to read a column by someone who is not claiming that, but in his or her argument show really the fidelity of the faith. So that's my point. So I think that is my question about how to distinguish. And let me say something about myself. I trust more Rose Althab, your time, than reading many Catholic outlets. And he is a Catholic, I know, but he doesn't write as a Catholic, rather than a good, sound, well-prepared journalist or columnist. I don't disagree at all. Uh, it, it, a lot of it depends on which forum, what's your forum, and what's your audience. If you're in a in a Catholic, uh, if you're writing for a Catholic publication with with a primarily Catholic audience, um, that 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 brings a different background. Just as if you're a if you're a business writer writing for a business audience as opposed to a general audience, you're, you're, it will change. But I, I remember years ago. Um, uh, trying to get an interview with Walker Percy, a uh, Catholic novelist, but he rejected the whole notion that he was a Catholic novelist. Uh, and and he, even though it's cl- his books are drenched in it, but he he described himself as a novelist who happens to be Catholic. Um, I, I think sometimes those Catholics who are in secular media and who are who are writing uh, um, well researched, balanced. Uh, approaches to things that they perform a great service. But I also think that journalism and especially diocesan papers and, 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 and uh, other, uh, other forums as well in our country, in our church right now is the only real adult faith formation that's going on. Um, I, I, I think the church's record I, 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 I suspect you would agree, but I mean, the church's record in terms of adult faith formation is abysmal. Uh, but I think that one area that where it can happen, and it may be indirectly and slowly, but I think it is there, is in is in Catholic media in general, and 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 I, I defend Catholic newspapers in that regard. I think it brings out the Catholic point of view. It lets people know what the bishops are saying, but also lets them know what their uh, fellows are doing. There's always the risk of clericalism, um, and, it's a, and it's it's a seduction that often, you know, I mean, some diocesan and papers have mandates that they feature their own bishop prominently on as many pages as possible. Um, that's not such a good thing, I don't think. But uh, but overall, I think that, that utilizing Catholic media is a way of growing uh, in one's faith, and it, and it certainly puts a responsibility on the journalist or the Catholic communicator to be, to be mindful of that. Christopher Zender, you've got to come into this. You've done journalism, uh, and you've done all sorts of writing that's directed, I think, primarily towards a Catholic audience. Yeah, uh, I think um, the whole question of, of ca- whether a Catholic is a Catholic journalist, or a journalist first, or a Catholic is, is similar to a question I'm actually writing an article about now. Is, is there such a thing as Catholic history? And um, I don't know if I should tell you the conclusion, but basically my conclusion with Catholic <laughs> history is that... It all began Catholic- at a small Texas radio station. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, I think there's a Catholic history in some ways is a misnomer because history has a discipline and and if you're an historian, you have to operate according to that discipline. And you can't um, simply shortchange it with revelation. At the same time, I think a Catholic historian has an advantage, and maybe this could be applied to anybody who has um, faith in the supernatural, but I think especially because a Catholic, because a Catholic can consider the, the, the world in a broader way. A materialist historian has, has to, by his very presuppositions, reject any kind of thing which seems like it, any hint of the supernatural. Whereas the Catholic can at least consider it, right? The Catholic historian doesn't have to say, uh, we, this miracle did occur. He has to, he has to um, but he can consider the fact that the miracle did occur, whereas the materialist just might, might just have to reject it out of hand. So I think it's mm-hmm. something similar with, with journalism, right? I mean, there's, a, there's an art of the journalist, um, and, and that will differ whether he's a columnist, whether he's a news reporter and the like. So and that's just one observation. But I guess uh, my question my question, you would be this, is that um, is, is there, uh, is there a, to what degree is any kind of Catholic, say, newspaper activist in its promotion of the Catholic faith? Or should it strive for what uh, secular journalism at least says it strives for, which is pure objectivity? So, um, I I studied journalism at University of California, Berkeley, and uh, and I, I always hated that I, that notion of the objective journalist. Um, it, it's uh, and I and I don't know if this is any longer even a rat. I mean, on the one hand, you have the new journalism, which was which in some ways was was more radically subjective. Um, you know, so, sort of coming out of Joan Didion and and uh, Tom Wolfe and others. Um, and I, and I wasn't such a big fan of that either, uh, though it was a fun to read. But I, I think I think the journalist is called. I, I would just nuance it a little bit. The journalist is is called to be fair, um, and uh, and I think that putting words into people's mouths, or you know, some some of the what I would consider bad journalism, where you have the um, you have one side summing up what the other side really means, kind of kind of stuff. Uh, I, I think weakens uh, it's bad journalism and weakens um, Catholic, the, you know, whatever Catholic message that is coming there. Uh, so, so that's one thought. The second, the second is about the activist thing. I, I, I do believe that it, that especially as we become more polarized, this is this is a threat. Um, of uh, you know, sort of ideological activism that um, that you find uh, you know obviously in social media and online a lot, but also in the in the um, in some publications. Um, if, if the activism is is if it's just to to you know rally the troops around uh, around a particular cause or something. Um, and it's in its opinion columns and editorials and all that it, it you know obviously that that can be legitimate in various uh, social concerns that the church is uh, strongly invested in um but i also I, but what isn't happening is i i don't think catholic media catholic media is um talking with people who have already made some degree of of commitment so um the area where if the activism is kind of an, an, an evangelization of the unchurched, if it's viewed that way, um, you know, that becomes more difficult to, to, to quantify, and I'm not sure sure how effective it is. Um, it's not getting into people's hands who aren't already, don't already have some some level of commitment. So, you know, what kind of activism, I'm not, I'm not sure um what you're what you're getting at there but i do think my one of the shaping influences in my career was uh, a man named francis mayer who was the editor of the national catholic register and then went on to 
uh, work with Archbishop Shapio. But we, when we were at the National Catholic Register, when I, where I got my start, you know, we, we would make sure to go out and talk to both sides of any particular issue. And we, you know, presented them, and it still was from a Catholic perspective, but, for example, if you're going to do a story um, on some, uh, say, abortion legislation or something, then you, 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 you talk to both sides on the issue, and then you, you wrote your story. And um, I think uh, I, I, that's the way I would tend to to approach the issues again, writing from you know the background of of um, your your faith. Uh, I mean, it's going to influence that, and it's going to influence the type of questions you have. But you're being, but you're trying to be fair in how you're presenting what the situation is. Whether you're purely objective, I, I'm really skeptical about that. I guess, <laughs> um, and. I, I I think sometimes that gets journalists into trouble where they think that they're being, you know, just the camera um, recording without uh, any sort of effort to shape what the events are. But I, I, I don't know how possible that is. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you entirely that when I was an editor of a small newspaper, I would tell my writers, you know, I don't expect you to be objective about this. I expect you to be fair to both sides. I'd always insist that they always interviewed both sides and gave them enough time to talk and not put mm-hmm. words in their mouth, that type of thing. Yeah, there's a kind of activism, I think is right. There's an activism which you try to distort things almost for a, a cause. But I'm thinking when people go into journalism, um, I, I would think that they, they have something they want, they have a message often they want to get out. They want to... They want to mm-hmm have a certain perspective on what's actually happening in the news. And they want to rep- ho- hopefully they want to report honestly on that. But at the same time, they're not coming from, they're, they're very, being very clear as they're Catholics that this, this is a, a newspaper written by Catholics from a Catholic perspective. And mm-hmm. even so the, many of the issues we're going to cover are issues which we think are important, because you do have to pick and choose what you're going to think is important. So, right. uh, and then your editorial, and your editorials and your columns can be purely opinion. But your your news right. reporting could be um, of a different sort. That's sort of the, what I think. Right, about. and it, 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 I agree. And and even in your and I think one area where we have to be careful is even in editorials and columns. I tend to write um, columns almost exclusively now, but um, but you, you try to. There is a fairness that needs to be. Um, I think that it needs to be evident there as well. At least when you're writing as a Catholic, you have to make sure you're not distorting the other side. But at the same time, you're also right that the passion people bring certain passions to to the to the to whatever it is that they're covering. In fact, you know that also is partly what makes can make the best writing <laughs> is that is that you you bring this passion as well as this uh, professional standards to the to the task, and the and the worst thing is when you have when you really don't care about the story you're writing. That's uh, that's that's um, can be quite a sign of burnout <laughs> at at some point. Um, and I've seen that in the Catholic press too. Um, it can it can be really hard. I think anyone who's worked around a a chancery or any church institution, you know, it's 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 not always edifying, which is true anywhere and and you have to measure yourself are you getting to a point where you <laughs> you you're becoming too sour to to continue to to do your work and and then you have to make some decisions yeah you know, i was actually glad to get out of journalism at a certain point in writing because mm-hmm. one thing i got tired of writing about homosexual issues and uh it was just sort of nice to go into history, because of course history uh-huh. is pristine and beautiful itself. But you know, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, what, one of my regrets is that when when I studied, I was a English major at Loyola Marymount, and I uh, always wanted the double major, but I was interested in too many things, and I and I just never settled. And I, I wished I had done history in retrospect. And I recently was trying to figure out a way to do a get a master's in church history uh, somewhere. But um, even in Washington, D.C., it's a little complicated. So if you, want, if you have a day job, 
So I, I haven't solved this issue yet, but um, I, I think as, as you get older, history becomes more and more fascinating. But. Talk about getting older. No, oh, don't talk about that. <laughs> I don't think any of us are as old as Jim. Right. Uh, let's let's get past that question and return to another question uh, on on that which happens on the sphere of the contingent. We might say. Uh, I like to think of myself as happening to be an American, uh, but not happening to be a Catholic. And uh, we could fast backwards. I surely think of uh, Paul of Tarsus as happening to be a tent maker. And if somebody says, oh, yeah, but that's just making tents, well, it's more than I could do, make a tent. And people's lives and welfare depended on the adequacy of the tent. Uh, nonetheless, I think of him as happening to be a tent maker, but I wouldn't think that he'd introduce himself as just happening to be a disciple. Uh, this is a, a shift uh, of terms, but one of the people I worked with, uh, a true scholar, a true scholar, really eminent, uh, told me that as things got more and more tense in the church, she'd in the past been happy to think of herself as a moderate Catholic but now, well, she was wondering, and I think I wrote her back saying, well, being a moderate Catholic, well, what would it be like to be a moderate husband? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to say I was a moderate Catholic. Uh, I don't know, does that connect with any of our discussion? <laughs> I, I, we're wandering a bit far afield, but uh, I remember there was a guy named Paul Wilkes uh, who wrote a book called The Good Enough Catholic. Uh-huh. Uh, I know the title. Uh, yeah. yeah I, be, I, be, I, be good enough, even as your heavenly father is good enough. Be good enough, that's right. Uh, and so I, I wrote a uh, harsh uh, review, as, when, and when you're uh, – Younger, you can you can. It's easier to be harsh, and I wrote this very harsh, and and I have to say, excessively long review for our Sunday visitor about it. And and then um, he contacted me, and he said, "Well, it's if you're going to be attacked, at least it's good when you're attacked when the person attacking you does a good job." And we we actually became friends uh, over this whole. Whole thing, and I and I and I think back on that. Um, uh, uh, you know, we we could agree to disagree on on all sorts of issues, but um, but the truth is, he he actually was was very good Catholic, but he was having trouble with uh, certain certain requirements or aspects um, uh, of the faith. Uh, your friend who's a moderate Catholic may mean that, the, the, is, does the moderate mean that she is sort of a lukewarm practitioner of the faith, or does it mean that on the issues that are particularly neuralgic uh, today and draped with all sorts of political um, ideology that, that she's a moderate in that, in, in that area? I, I, I would distinguish there i think i think one can be a passionate catholic and be maybe moderate on on some of the when you're applying this sort of political overlay um to the issues and of course that's what gets everyone all hot and bothered um i i would just say that that i would i would want to you know ask her the follow-up question on that but sure uh what about uh, the daily life of Catholic journalists and people working in Catholic publishing? Well, I know somebody who 
referred to them as ink-stained wretches. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you make of that, cad. Greg? What a cad. Uh, and a bounder. It is, it is, a cad and a bounder. <laughs> It is a traditional description of uh, a dismissive description of, of journalists. New uh, Grub Street, New Grub Street. <laughs> um, so, it's in, in in Catholic journalism today, I think there's there's various uh, changes that are taking place. Uh, you know, I alluded to it earlier about Catholic Press Association becoming Catholic Media Association. Um, I, I've been attending these. Uh, except for the time I worked in Rome, I, I was I've attended all of the Catholic media conferences since 1983, I think. And uh, you know, one thing that I've noticed is is um, there's actually after a, after a long period of what seemed like sort of uh, actuarial stasis, uh, we started getting younger people coming in um, there's there's definitely more women involved uh, in in Catholic journalism um, the other uh, other group that you you do see is sort of people who have left secular media because of course part of it being the radical downsizing that's going on in in, in secular media um, and and so you have people coming in who have uh, uh, you know a lot of secular journalism experience who may have a real commitment to their faith or at least are moderate Catholics and uh, uh, in, a, in a practice practicing sense. And so they come in um, and, and get a job at the local diocesan paper or perhaps with the magazine. So, so you do, you know, you do seeing, um, you do seeing that you're getting people who are much more uh, digitally oriented as, as everywhere else uh, and who are comfortable, you know, certainly now, any, as opposed to when I went to school, uh, anyone who's in, who's learning journalism, the craft from a professional point of view or just a personal point of view, you, you're going to be able to take pictures and film video and uh, operate in the social media realm as well as as knocking out a good you know 500 or 800 word story uh, on deadline. So um, you know I, I think that is. Uh, all that is going on. I think two issues that affect Catholic journalism, of course, and probably have a li- to a certain extent for a while, but but it seems to be getting worse. One is can can people support their families? On that, it used to be that Catholic journal first newspaper journalism in the United States um, was was actually very clerical dominated early on, um, but it became a place where uh, primarily men worked and they could support their family. Um, I think now the it's it's harder and harder. It's usually you have to be operating in a dual income uh, environment, um, and and that makes things different in terms of how people move up in the world. You you would have in the in the olden days you had someone like Jerry Sherry, uh, who was a transplanted Brit who could move around at different diocese and newspapers and sort of work work his way up and then be a freelancer in retirement. Um, now it's it's harder to move around. So you know you might start at a small paper, and then move to a larger paper, or uh, you know it's sort of professionally developed. But but that's that gets tougher when you've got a, a spouse who's working somewhere else, and so you you tend not to have as much of that kind of movement um, going on, which I think hurts uh, Catholic journalism, hurts hurts the field. Um, uh, and, and that's that's one issue, and um, and then the other issue that's taking place is that you're having more people coming in from non-journalistic areas. Um, they might work in PR, they might work in marketing. Uh, they bring uh, often a, a, a greater digital awareness and awareness of social media, but but they're not really print oriented, and they and they may not be really reporting oriented. They're more looking at things from a publicity point of view. And I think that is something that, that can be a threat to, to the quality of Catholic journalism. Um, that having said that, there are people who do a great job coming in uh, from that background. But it, it's, um, 
it, it starts making the journal, you know, things start looking like a press release instead of a story, and, and that's a problem. Well, Christopher, Mario, where, where should we turn now in, in our interrogation of this uh, <laughs> source of real information and real insight? Yes. I, I, I have a follow-up question to one of your answers, and I was uh, uh, following my motto. I, was, uh, I have been listening very carefully. You said at one point that today Catholic journalism is suffering. I don't remember you used this word, but uh, it's going through uh, extreme polarization. In other words, I assume mm -hmm. that there are outlets or um, agencies who hold certain views and then others hold different or the opposite view. And so that has that is leading to what you said, fragmentation. Now, my question is, to what? What are the roots or the causes of that polarization? If you could somehow explain a little bit about that. That's a big topic um, and one that I'm interested in. Uh, I, I think first, I think the church is being, uh, Catholics are being very influenced by the, uh, what's happening in the, the polarization that's taking place in the political sphere. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of discussion now about, you know, are we a Catholic first and then a Democrat or a Catholic first and then a Republican or are we a Catholic first and, a, and then <laughs> a voter? Um, and uh, Bishop Kevin Rhodes from Fort Wayne South Bend gave a, uh, interesting speech on this whole topic, uh, September 24th, um, to, uh, Holy Cross College in South Bend. And, and he, he looks at that whole, uh, notion of how, uh, where Catholics are using the, you know, the sort of political, they're making decisions based on sort of political allegiances rather than on what the church is teaching. So I think that's one factor of, of some of the polarization that's going on. Um, I think the, the debasement of discourse, in, particularly in social media, is, is, is hastening all of this. So not only are people becoming more polarized, but they're becoming more nasty um, uh, at, the, at the same time. And I, I think there's a third element, which is that, uh, it, which is, based on studies that Pew and, and other research groups are doing, which is um, as they watch the decline of newspapers at the local level, so there's more, I think there's 200, I'm going to forget all the stats exactly, but, you know, something like 200 counties in the United States that now have no newspapers of any sort at all, uh, and that's growing. More and more papers are uh, declining, um, and, uh, the quality is, is even when they, they manage to exist, there's, it's still declining. So what, what's happening is, is that people are turning to national sources more for their news, and the national sources tend to be more polarized. Local media tends to be um, less polarizing because it's your neighbors, it's you know, people who are in your community, um, and at a national level it can get, uh, more extreme, and so this polarization effect is is being accentuated at the local level. And I, I worry about that a little bit with the, again with the Catholic Church because as bishops close their newspapers or limit the reporting that's being done, some people just simply drift away, and and that's not good for the church. Other people um, are turning to 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 again. Uh, national media or or websites or uh, interest groups that um, again being driven you know often working on a donation model they are likely to be more polarizing because that's what generates interest and co and commitment and and revenue um, you know anger and fear um, hold your attention more and and uh, so I, I think all this is a, is a, a concern for the church and, and, and reasons 
that are sort of feeding this polarization. Uh, and and I don't know if, if you, we want to get into social media or not, but I do. There, on Netflix, there is a documentary called Social Dilemma, uh, which you know, which I recommend for just laying out, you know, some some of what the impact of all this is happening on on these um, uh, mo monopolistic titans that are controlling so much of what we receive now, Google and uh, Facebook and, and all that. And, and you can see it at the meta level, but at the micro level, I think it's, 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 it's impacting the, my fear is that it's impacting the church. Now, Bishop Burbage uh, just has uh, issued a new uh, pastoral letter on communications. Could you outline some of what he has to say? Sure. This is this is, uh, I think, really uh, a, a positive development. Um, I don't know when a, a U.S. bishop last issued a, a pastoral on communications. Um, there, there have been a number of documents that have come out of of uh, what used to be called the Pontifical Council for Social Communications, which was um, for a long time headed by Cardinal John Foley, uh, who was from Philadelphia, and they issued. Um, issued a couple of really impressive documents. Uh, but uh, Bishop Burbage is chair of the Bishop's Communication Committee. He'll be the chair for, for one more year. And uh, he issued a pastoral called In Tongues uh, All Can Hear, uh, communicating, uh, communicating the Hope of Christ in Times of Trial. And uh, the the document it's funny uh, Jim when you were talking about the the tent maker because it actually sort of starts looking at kind of how communication and evangelization starting with the uh, uh, Pentecost of course and 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 which is sort of where the the title comes from and the idea that that imbued with the spirit filled with the spirit then then we go out and communicate that's the evangelizing impulse of so communication is central to to who we are as Catholics and Christians, and and so the beginning of the document looks a little bit at that Pentecost and 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 what happens in Acts of the Apostles, uh, and then uh, looks at at recent developments in uh, communication, what's been what's been happening, and you know takes a sort of quick view through uh, the the. the the media, especially social media and the digital reality that we're all dealing with, and then then looks at uh, well, and looks at their uh, strengths and, and dangers. And of course, Pope Francis, uh, Pope Benedict, uh, both have written um, a fair amount on this. Pope Francis has has been sort of diligently returning to this topic. Benedict did in his World Days of Communications, and so you know that that the new forms of communication have have strengths, but also uh, weaknesses, and I think Francis has particularly been warning more of um, his concern for for some of the the dangers of of the new media, and then it, and then it, the the document sort of looks at what what we've seen with the pandemic and this sort of unexpected shutdown of of what of parish life and church life and you know this this trauma that happened to us, and then how the how the new media and new technolo technologies helped us. So the, the notion of being able to stream a Bishop Barron's Mass or, you know, a, a Mass from uh, the Basilica in Washington, D.C., um, when we were sort of shuttered in our houses, you know, this was, this was, um, this was great. It was a way to communicate. It was a way for local parishes to communicate um, and, to, and to keep connected with people. And, um, and so he, he talks about... Uh, all of that, some of the, the way that we reach people, the way we've developed uh, multiple channels. And then uh, at the end, he, he sort of talks about, you know, what lessons we've learned from this and how, uh, it, what, what does the church need to do? And I think what's really important, there's, there's a passage um, near the end where he says, this is a critical time for the church beset as she is by many of the same stresses that are affecting secular institutions Yet it is important that the church maintain and develop the capacity to tell her story. This is not an appeal for propaganda, even less for fake news. We must invite people beyond man-made ideologies and towards a deeper understanding of what we mean when we profess that God is with us. And so, uh, 
it, it's it's a I think a, a robust defense of of the vocation and the profession of of uh, Catholic communications and Catholic communicators, and then it ends with ten uh, points of uh, you know sort of that are both warning people a little bit and and guiding people on how they use media. So um, they're they're uh, described different ways. One you know one for example is invite, don't push. Uh, people are overwhelmed by digital communications. Um, find effective ways to get the church's message in front of people without being aggressive is a constant challenge. Um, one of the points that I think is, is it's really important for the church right now, church leadership, is that it's a two-way street. Um, communication is not just talk. It demands listening. And I, I think one of the uh, aspects of Catholic media that, that sometimes gets underestimated is, is it's a way for people to hear from the church and, and from its uh, authorities and all, but it's also a way for the church to hear its people. And sometimes that, that, that is seen as a one-way street instead of a two-way street. And I think that's dangerous uh, and, and, and not helpful. Um, there, you know, I've, I've heard stories of, of bishops who, for example, get rid of the letters to the editor because they, they don't want any, they don't want to receive any criticism. Um, you know, and, and you just create this little little bubble, or uh, uh, you know, you, you're you're missing the opportunities for people to have a sense of ownership of of that means of communication, and and you're missing an opportunity to hear what people are really saying. I think that's that's kind of an undervalued aspect of Catholic communications that that I think it would be good we don't lose. I'm very glad you were able to give us that outline. Uh, I suspect that that's just the kind of letter, uh, pastoral, that will get lost in the shuffle, so I'm glad you mm -hmm. called that to our attention. Now, you know, as with all our guests, uh, you're, you're giving us your time, and we appreciate that, but... With all our guests, uh, call us pushy if you want. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to, before the show gets to the very end, especially since there's a philosophical question awaiting us, uh, put it to you squarely. Do you agree that the American Solidarity Party is the wave of the future? <laughs> <laughs> Should I? Uh, I, I, I can't. Uh, I, I can either uh, agree or disagree. Uh, being being a uh, uh, member of the uh, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops as as director of Catholic News Service, I can't take a position on that. But it certainly well, is. What about this friend of yours? You know, a friend who you've always admired, <laughs> who says, "Well, what does this friend of yours, who you've always admired, say? Does he say we're just the rivulet of the future, or does he say we're the wave of the future, and why, well, in a hundred uh, words or less?" I think. I think I, I, we we all know the the rather uh, weak history that third parties have have had in the United States, but I certainly would say that 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 one can report that there seems to be a frustration with the two that were. Um, stuck with these days. Uh, damn the know, duopoly! Uh, Can we report that you said <laughs> damn the duopoly? Uh, I, I did not say that, but I certainly <laughs> am reporting but that other people have said that. that. <laughs> I did, you know, one of my, uh, someone that, that um, I have a great deal of respect for, Charlie Camosi uh, from Fordham, uh, was the first person to call my attention to the American Solidarity Party, and and uh, uh, he used to be very involved with Democrats for Life, and and has sort of left them, and uh, is is very um, supportive of the party. And then um, Bishop Rhodes, in his um, talk that I was referencing earlier, which is available uh, at, in Origins, the documentary service published by Catholic News Service. See how subtly I got that plug in. Um, they. Uh, well done. <laughs> the uh, origin uh, published this talk by by um, Bishop Rhodes, um, and and Rhodes talks about the American Solidarity Party and about the possibility of a 
you know, could there be a third party that, that somehow better represents um, the, the column that I'm writing for the Angelus or that should be appearing shortly, I think, uh, is a little bit about this whole notion of Catholics feeling politically homeless. And uh, Bishop Rhodes um, talks about that as well. So, so some, I can report that some Catholics are finding a home with the, <laughs> with the American Solidarity Party. Others, others refer to us as the gang that can't shoot straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on, on a more forward note, uh, one of the things that the party likes to say is siempre adelante con juicio. <laughs> Who are some of the the saints and and heroes uh, who have been some of the saints and heroes of Catholic journalism and publishing. This is this is a great question, and and it, and it's also um, it, it, it can be a frustrating question because you think about uh, you know I mean in some ways there's so many different people uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll just I'll just say a few. Um, uh, and and they're kind of you know maybe my saints and heroes. Uh, one an obvious one is Saint Francis de Sales, is the patron of Catholic journalists. Uh, but I also think Saint Maximilian Kolbe um, deserves uh, deserves some kudos here uh, because he was he was uh, willing to try all different sorts of media um, to spread the message. I mean whether he was a journalist, it, it, it maybe. Uh, more an evangelist, but what I liked about it was that his willingness to to try whatever was new to uh, to, to communicate the good news. I think that um, is admirable and a lesson for us. Um, John uh, Archbishop John Knoll was the founder of Our Sunday Visitor, and he is a remarkable man, and he. Uh, was an exemplar of these kind of entrepreneurial bishops that we saw uh, around the beginning of the last century and, and through the middle part of the century. You know, fi- you know, uh, he started with a little magazine called "Kind Wo- Kindly or Kind Words from Your Pastor," which I just love that and 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 that sort of down home way, which of course led to the whole notion uh, the title of our Sunday visitor when I. When I first started working for our Sunday visitor, my sister asked me, "Can you change its name?" But I, I, I grew on to love the name, and uh, and it, it reflected uh, Archbishop Knoll's vision uh, of this newspaper, of this great national newspaper, along with the National Catholic Register when it was being published by the Archdiocese of Denver. They were the two great chains, and Archbishop Knoll was a passionate defender of the church. Uh, he did battle with all sorts of anti-Catholics. Uh, he uh, was fearless, and he created uh, a lasting, you know, media uh, organization. So I, I think he would he would go in my pantheon. Um, Cardinal John Foley, uh, who uh, served for so many years as as president of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. Um, after being the editor of the Philadelphia Catholic newspaper, uh, was always a defender of the Catholic uh, press, and and wrote uh, his his um, document Itatis Novi, which came out in 1992, I think, is a terrific document uh, worth rereading now. And then finally, um, one of my mentors, uh, I, had, I had two terrific mentors. One was uh, Fran Mayer. Uh, and that I mentioned earlier, who was editor of the National Catholic Register, and then Bob Lockwood, who I followed in his footsteps. He was uh, president and publisher of our Sunday Visitor, and um, and Bob was was the most honorable of Catholic gentlemen, and who was ambitious in in expanding uh, Catholic media, and I. Oh, a great deal to him. So those, so those would be my saints and heroes. A, a good list, a good list. Now, we only have one minute left, and you know people don't have time for philosophy. But damn it, they're going to get one minute. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Do you think uh, that there's a, a conflict 
deep conflict between the word, think of publishing journalism, and the image. And can they be integrated? And uh, who could we be reading maybe about the relationship of the word and the image? That's a good question, and and we only have a minute, and it's, and it's probably the <laughs> I just book. wanted to let you know that we can go a little bit over here, Greg. <laughs> yeah. uh, we can go maybe half hour more. Continue. Yeah. Actually, I have, I have, I have, I do have a meeting. I have to. No, have I'm to just teasing. I'm just teasing. But I. You know, I, in the Euthyphro, in the Euthyphro, uh, Socrates is talking to Euthyphro, and they're going back and forth, and Euthyphro says, i got to get to the trial. I can't, I can't <laughs> linger right. here. Go well, ahead. I, yeah, I love how you pitch these softball questions. <laughs> at the end, but um, the, I would say that I, I, I think this is true. I, I mean, one of our concerns, I think, all of us here is, is are, you know, are we moving more and more towards a post-literate culture and, in, in which the image becomes so dominant? Uh, and uh, and then, and and what does that mean for us? And and what happens in terms of a lack? It, does there become a lack of um, of analytical or or reflect, reflective uh, thought? Uh, you know, I I started watching the evening news because I realized at one point that I was reading you know you know multiple newspapers and all this, but actually. The evening news, what I was missing was the images. And the images are often more powerful or, or stuck with people more. I mean, advertising uh, gets this notion. I mean, every drug commercial we see, uh, while it's busy telling us that our, our limbs are going to fall off and our eyeballs are going to fall out, they're showing all these happy images of the person who has been cured by this very expensive medical uh, you know, uh, prescription and and they're you know with their family or with their friends or whatever and and meanwhile you have this little voiceover that's telling you you know every, how you're going to die uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a function if it may cause work, sudden right? death if you have this problem yeah. please please let us know <laughs> I mean, my, my, you know, I love with, with the drug that's supposed to be helping you with this particular problem, in fact, can, can cause the problem, you know. <laughs> it's the, the, breath, the, the drug that will help you breathe can cause shortness of breath or whatever. Um, so why, did, why does advertising do that? Because we are attracted to the image, and the image dominates, and the other part doesn't stick with us. And, and you know, what's happening in social media now, everything's moving to video. And, and of course, TikTok is is you know the uh, you know ultimate example of that. But I mean, Facebook, everything is moving to video. Everyone wants these short little clips, and then they, and if you ever notice, they're all subtitled because people are watching them at work, and they don't want someone <laughs> to hear the voiceover. So you get the, the the subtitle, so you can you can listen to it without anyone knowing that you're listening to it. But you know, this is so. What you're on to is 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 really important. How how do we you know as as <laughs> you know we're 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 moving back to this, to, you know, to what I'm calling the, the post literate culture where the image now has to teach. You know, and you think about the great basilica in Assisi. You know, where the Giotto's pictures of the life of Saint mm, Francis. Yes, and of yes. course, that's how people in, in a in a in a non literate, you know, unliterate illiterate. Uh, uh, culture that was how you taught um, and you know maybe we're heading back that way and maybe I'm just the old dinosaur who's still hooked on words but um, but in any case it's a very serious issue I think what you're what you're getting at there all right well if you're a dinosaur I consider you a T-Rex and <laughs> we're, short we're, going to, short we're going to end on uh, the sober note of, of the word, as we always do, the gospel of the day. According to Luke, the Lord said, Woe to you, Pharisees, you pay tithes of mint and of rue and of every garden herb, but, but you pay no attention to judgment and to love for God. These you should have done without overlooking the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, you love the seat of honor in synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, you are like unseen graves over which people unknowingly walk. 
Then one of the scholars of the law said to him in reply, Teacher, by saying this, you are insulting us too. And he said, Woe also to you scholars of the law. You impose on people burdens hard to carry, but you yourselves do not lift one finger to touch them. Come, Lord Amen. Jesus, come. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. All right. Thank you and, very much. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Mario. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.